All right, what's going on, bullish bears? So today we're going to be doing part two of the Daily Trading Coach by Brett and Steenbarker, 101 Lessons for Becoming Your Own Trading Psychologist. So in part one, we talked about change and how change affects you as a trader and the things that you need to embrace and develop in order to change properly. So today we're going to be talking about stress and distress and uh, kind of creative Creative coping for traders, uh, creative recognition for traders, uh, being able to analyze and use that stress, um, the good and the bad, to help you be successful in the market. Uh, this one's pretty self-explanatory, so we'll just kind of jump right into it. Okay, Understanding stress. So eliminating or reducing stress is impossible, okay? Because the nature of trading lives in risk and uncertainty. If we all knew what was going to happen at all times, we'd all be millionaires, right? So the whole point of being a trader is that you are kind of in this market and you don't know what's going to happen. So you just need to do your best to protect yourself and have contingencies for whichever way the current happens to be flowing, okay? So what you don't want to do is you don't want to confuse stress and distress because not all psychological stress brings distress and not all psychological stress is bad. Now I know that seems confusing, but we'll kind of get into it and break it down a little bit. So psychological stress is, think of stress, and I know normally we, we talk about stress with a negative connotation, like, oh, I'm so stressed. But stress is neither positive nor negative. Stress is a matter of fact. Stress is a physiological response. So it's just a heightened physical and cognitive state that prepares us for dealing with challenges. So think of like your fight or flight, okay? Something happens and you become alert. That is that is stress. It is very matter of fact. It's neither good nor bad, it just is, okay? So your psychological state of stress mobilizes your energy, shifts you from boredom, makes you alert and observant, so it can facilitate your performance to help you in a situation, okay? So that's all um, your psychological stress is. Now, psychological distress is the negative interpretation of normal stress, right? And that happens because you have a perception that you're incompetent to change the negative situation that you're in. So um, let's say uh, um, the example that we're going to use is driving on a snowy road, okay? So if you uh, are have experienced driving on a snowy road, um, you know that the car can be a little slippery, things, you know, you may not be able to see what's happening in front of you if it's actively snowing, okay? So you, as you're driving, are are observant and you're watching what's happening on the road and you're aware of how your car feels and you're aware of the gas pedal, you're aware of everything, right? So that is psychological stress. Now, if you've never driven on an icy road before, you're aware of all those things, you're feeling all that, but you're telling yourself, I've never felt this before. I don't know what to do. I'm going to crash the car. If the car starts sliding, which way do I, which way do I turn the steering wheel? Can I stop the car from sliding? That's distress because you're taking the normal stress and you feel incompetent to control it or to change the situation that you're in, which is causing you distress. So that's the difference between the two. Well, why we're all here, right? How does this relate to trading? Well, when you put your capital at risk, you're effectively driving on a snowy road, okay? When you are in the market, you're alert, you're processing your situation in real time, and you're making course corrections as needed to your position, um, whether that be through stops, through sizing, what have you, okay? Now, if you have experience bouncing back from losses, you have mechanisms in place to limit your losses, and you view losing as a normal part of trading, you're unlikely to become distressed because you're aware of it, you've done it before, you know how this works, you know how the car handles in this in different types of situations, right? So when you have a loss, it's a mere annoyance, um, much like having to drive in a snowstorm if you're experienced, you're just like, oh, I can do it. I mean, I don't want to do it, but I can do it and I'm not gonna die doing it, okay? Now, however, if you don't have a plan or the correct mindset, um, you become dis distressed, which minimizes your ability to focus, analyze, and make rapid course corrections as needed. And that's when you start 
having the problem. That's when you start um, freaking out and being unable to think objectively and process things um, because you, you move from just being stressed to being distressed. Okay. So position size limits, trading plans, and stop loss levels are like snow tires on your vehicle. They may not seem to do a lot uh, for you when things are going really well, but they're vital for when you're in a snowstorm. When you're in adverse conditions, those snow tires make all the difference because they help you stay calm, right? Because in the end, a panicky driver or a panicky trader doesn't have control. If you can't think and you can't process what's happening to you correctly, you're not in control of your situation. So now your challenge as your own trading coach is to embrace stress. Not embrace distress, but embrace stress. So your goal is to start the day, okay? You wanna have position sizing guidelines. You wanna have a per trade loss limit. You wanna have a per trade price target. And then you wanna have a daily loss limit. Now these are all pretty simple. We've talked about these before. You say, you know, um, per trade, I only want to lose you know, $400 per trade, or I, I can only lose $50 per trade. And then cumulative throughout the day, once I hit, three, once I'm down $300 on the day, or once I'm down $1,000 on the day, that's when I stop, that's when I walk away, okay? Now, your risk should always be smaller than your, than your reward, okay? Because you wanna make sure that you're minimizing, you're cutting those losses um, short so that when you have those losses, they're not overtaking your wins, okay? If you're a frequent trader, uh, no single loss should prevent you from making money on the day. So no single trade should be so large that you can't be profitable on the week. So if you have um, keeping your your uh, risk smaller than your reward, let's say you have one, one win and one loss every day, one winning trade and one losing trade every day, you should still be coming out green at the end of the day, okay? So preparation and familiarity keep stress from becoming distress because they enhance your sense of control on the situation. So you want to be prepared for adversity and you'll respond with normal stress, normal attention, normal focus, rather than panic and distress. So there are kind of a couple different factors that play into stress. Um, and if you're not sure, here's kind of a quick uh, stress test, right? So you want to... Uh, I'm going to name a couple things, and then you want to label these on a scale of 1 to 5, from rarely, never, occasionally, sometimes, fairly often, and most of the time. So how often do the following interfere, or the following uh, situations or emotions interfere with your work and or your relationship? Nervousness or anxiety. Uh, a downbeat or depressed mood. Frustration or anger. Guilt or self-blame alcohol or any other substance, arguments or fights, fatigue or exhaustion, problems sleeping, headaches, stomach aches or muscle tension, excessive worrying or negative thinking. Okay. Now, any score of four or higher could be a potential trigger for turning normal stress into distress. So your job is to maintain a mindset that keeps you confident and that keeps your motivation high when you're training, when you're reviewing, um, when you're preparing for the day. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean repealing stress from your life. It means creating active firewalls between stress and distress. So you have a minute to think about it and to be objective and to pick it apart and understand what information that stress is trying to give you so that you can then use it productively in your trades um, and in that situation that you happen to be in, okay? And so what is the best psychological firewall for stress? Risk management. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second here. Antidotes for toxic trading assumptions. So what we expect from life shapes our emotional experiences. If you expect good things, you're gonna have optimistic and energetic experiences. If you expect bad things, you're gonna have pessimistic and anxious experiences. If you expect that success will elude you, you're gonna always feel discouraged and depressed. And if you expect perfection, you're gonna be continuously or disappointed with yourself uh, because most of us never reach perfection, at least you know, not in the first few tries, uh, potentially after Lots of practice, maybe, but uh, in the meantime, the learning process, you'll always be disappointed with yourself. 
Now our emotions are a gauge of the degree to which we're meeting those expectations, right? Our emotions are a gauge of that tell us whether or not we are being who we want ourselves to be if we're meeting those goals. So if your expectations are biased, you're likely to experience skewed emotions. So if you tell yourself, you know, I want to make a million dollars in a month, and when you don't make it, you're going to beat yourself up for it, when realistically you never had a chance of making a million dollars your first month trading. Okay. So why is this relationship between emotion and expectation important to us as traders? Well, a couple things. You want to make sure that at, through your trading journey, you're fostering positive experiences that sustain motivation and learning that keep you motivated and keep you learning and keep you growing. That is the number one thing that's going to contribute to your success uh, because you can have setbacks, but if you keep that motivation and you continue to plow forward and you continue to grow, you will overcome those setbacks. Okay. When you're discouraged, defeated, and fearful, you're not an effective learner. You're not going to grow the way you need to. You're not going to be able to be objective and see things the way you should be seeing things in order to overcome the obstacles in front of you. Okay? Because in order to be focused and maintain that concentration, you have to be absorbed in the market. And you can't be absorbed in the market if you're battling emotional stress or you're battling emotional distress because it's splitting your focus, it's splitting your concentration. Okay? So a big part of this is making sure you're checking your premise when you arrive at a contradictory conclusion. Now here's an example of that. Let's say you want you want to make a trade on Tesla, okay? So you say I'm going to get in at Tesla at X price, and my um, my goal is to make four dollars on this trade, okay? So you get in and price moves four dollars, and you sell, and you feel great, okay? And then you notice that price action keeps moving, and it ended up moving ten dollars in your direction, okay? But you got out at four dollars. Well, the number one thing you want to do is keep a level head. Two, you need to tell yourself, remind yourself of your expectations and say, I should be happy. My goal was to make $4 and I made $4. I made a good trade. This was a great trade. Don't beat yourself up over the $6 that you quote unquote left on the table because that was never part of your original expectation. Okay. So you, you should tell yourself, I shouldn't be selfish. I should not focus on the things outside of my goal because today I set a goal um, and I met that goal. And that was a good thing. So now we're just going to break down the top three trader toxic expectations. So these are things that most uh, new traders will tell themselves um, and they think it's a good thing and it really just ends up hurting them in, a lo in the long run. Okay. So number one is a good day is a winning day. This is a terrible expectation to have because what it does is it links your emotional experience to your P&L. And what will end up happening is you will realize that you are not happy unless you're green and you, if you're red, you're beating yourself up. And what this does is it's just setting you up for disappointment because we know that we do not control the market. So there are, there will be days when you do everything correctly and you still end up red. And those days you should be happy that you, that you controlled everything well that was in your control, but the market still handed you a red day. When you have this mindset of a good day is a winning day, those days you're going to be beating yourself up for absolutely no reason. It's very counterproductive um, to your to your growth as a trader. Okay, so what you want to be thinking instead is that a good day is one in which you're following your trading rules, that you're getting your entries and exits correctly, and more than anything that you're um, that you are following good risk management. Okay. That's a good day because even if you come out red on that day, you can still tell yourself these, I, everything that was within my control in this trade, I handled effectively and I did well. So it's still a good day. It's still a good trade. Okay. So it could, because as we know, stumbling into lucky wins does not generate long-term profits only by repeating, um, trading rules and sound practices over and over and over again. Can we generate sustained profits over time? So when you go into trading expecting profits every day, um, you're setting yourself up for emotional letdown because it's impossible. We all experience red days. Okay, it's a part of trading. Anyone who tells you that they've never had a red day is lying to you. Okay. And number three, working harder at trading means trading more often. So the false assumption here is, oh, if I trade, I'll learn along the way and I'll build skills quickly because I'll be doing it live 
in the market. And what ends up happening is you end up just forfeiting your profit and giving all your profit uh, away over the market or to the market or to your broker, right, through fees or what have you. Because if you don't follow the steps and you don't know what you're looking at, if you just jump into the market and try to learn along the way, whenever you have a losing trade, you don't know why you lost. And worse off, whenever you have a winning trade, you don't know what you did to win. So you can't recreate that again um, in your next trade. So you're basically just jumping in and you're hoping that the, that the current is going to swing, uh, shift in your direction. And that's basically trading without an edge. Okay, so when you don't have an edge and you jump into the market without waiting for that A plus setup where everything is working in favor of your trade, your trade starts off as a loser. So you, you know, might as well have just closed your eyes and, uh, you know, hit the buy button because that's basically what you're doing. You want to make sure that every time you jump in that it's calculated and you know what you're doing and you know what to expect and you know the elements of the trade that you can control and you know the elements of the trade that you can't control. So proper development comes from study, observation, tracking, uh, watching price action, and then you give it a shot in the simulator and then you jump into the market real time. Now, that doesn't all necessarily have to be 100%. We were just talking about this in the trade room this morning that um, we had a member who it was very comfortable in the simulator and wanted to transition into trading from the simulator into the real market. And uh, one of the moderators told her, uh, you know, trade in the simulator on Monday, trade in the market Tuesday, trade in the simulator Wednesday, trade in the market Thursday, and then trade in the simulator on Friday. So you got to kind of get a good feel of both so you learn to kind of wade in slowly into trading real time. And that's how you do it. The, the member was managing risk by not throwing themselves headfirst into the market. And um, that's what's important because you don't want to be throwing yourself headfirst and then just guessing and hoping that things are going to go your way. Okay. So what you, what, what's so dangerous about this is that when you expect your trading to generate learning, then your learning is going to take hits when you trade um, badly. Okay. Or when you, uh, come out red. So if you're linking your emotions to your PL and you're expecting your trading to teach you, okay, when you come out red, you're going to beat yourself up because you're red. And then um, because you quote unquote didn't learn anything from that trade because you came out red, now you feel discouraged and you don't want to continue to grow and you don't want to continue to learn. So that's a surefire way to burn yourself out of the market very quickly. Number three. Success means making a living from trading. Now, this is a guaranteed way to uh, create frustration and discouragement, okay? What you want to remember is that no developing professional makes their living from their performance during the early years of expertise building. This is going to take time, okay? And I think what a lot of traders don't understand because of the way people talk about it, okay? Trading is a profession, so you need to treat it like a profession. I tell people trading is like if you want to be an accountant or you want to be, you know, a doctor or you want to be anything, it is a, it is a job and you're not going to learn it in a month. Okay. So let's say you want to become a surgeon. You do four years of medical school. You do four years as a surgical resident. And then if you have a specialty, you do another couple of years on top of that. So in a, in a profession like being a surgeon, it takes 10 plus years to learn. So what makes you think that after watching three YouTube videos or after trading for a month, you're going to become a millionaire. You're not, it's not going to happen. Okay. So, uh, expectations to make a sustainable living within the first years of exposure to the markets is unrealistic. What you have to understand is that trading, um, is a mashup of finance and economics. And the way I see it is if I wanted to get a master's in finance, I have to go to college for six years to learn that. To, to learn that effectively, okay? If I want a master's in economics, I have to go to college another six years to learn that effectively. Well, trading smashes those two things together, okay? And then to top it all off, it sprinkles psychology and emotional control over the two. So the fact that you have these complex things that are all mashed together and you have to um, climb over that mountain without help because again we're retail traders so we don't really have mentors we're not working for a company we don't have a, a boss you know who's a trader that we can be like hey can you explain this to me so we have to do all this without a safety net 
So this is going to take time. So make sure that you are giving it the time that it deserves and, and that you understand that it's going to take time because then when you fall short of that expectation of making a million dollars in the first six months, you're going to get discouraged and you're going to get burned out and, and it's not going to be for you. Okay. So remember, there is no path to expertise that doesn't require time to develop mere competence. So just not to exceed or not to become a millionaire, just to be competent, just to be able to get into a trade and understand what you're looking at and understand your feelings in the moment and understand what's happening around you. That's competence. And that's just going to take, that's going to take time just to get there. Okay. Just to not drown. So how do we combat these expectations of unrealistic assumptions? Well, you want to make sure that you're including your experiences in your trading journal, okay? That you're including your expectations for the day, your goals for trading that day, um, your expectations for development over time, okay? You want to make sure that they are reasonable and they are attainable and that you're working towards them um, in an incremental way every single day. So that way you are creating that efficacy, right? So you're setting a goal, you see yourself working towards that goal, you see yourself attaining that goal, and then you take steps and attain that goal. Okay. So a good, a good example would be, uh, I want to learn, uh, I want to earn more than the riskless rate of return after trading costs. And I want to do that by risking less than the proportions of my capital. So basically this is saying after I take all of my fees and everything out, I want to have, um, a good return and I want to do it by not, um, or by obeying a good measure of risk and not using all of my capital on a one-to-one -one, uh, just so I can make a buck, right? So this is a good goal. It's something that you can implement in your daily trading. It's a good assumption. It's something that is reasonable, that is attainable. What you want to be doing is you also want to be targeting positive risk adjusted returns, uh, which integrate performance and process goals. Again, it's creating that efficacy because your goals and your performance need to tie together so that you set a goal, you see yourself attaining that goal, and then you set a game plan. And by following that game plan, you attain that goal. And that creates positive reinforcement. It just, it's, that's everything that's good about the process of trading and learning and growing. Because if you achieve those expectations, you feel a sense of pride and accomplishment, which keeps you motivated, which keeps you happy to learn, which keeps you growing. And if you fall short, you can uh, see that you're falling short and all you got to do is reassess your risk, pull it back a little bit, s jump back in. Okay. You have a plan B, you have things that you can change that are within your control in that situation so that you never feel like this is never something that you're never going to get. Okay. That is the big difference. When somebody who doesn't have a game plan fails, they think, oh, I'm never going to get this. When somebody who has reasonable expectations and a game plan fails, they say, you know what? Uh, I didn't tweak my entry correctly, or I didn't tweak my exit correctly. Next time, that's what I'm going to do. And so it's just, again, more positive forward movement for growth. So what you want to do is you want to always be expecting success, but the right kind of success, right? So success is not coming out green or making a thousand dollars a day success is making good trades making sure you're sticking to your good entries and exits making sure that you have good risk management and then you want to make sure that you define the success as something that's challenging for you but also attainable so that you can see yourself accomplishing it what causes the stress that interferes with trading decisions all right story time so raise your hand if you've done any of these right have you become anxious and exited a good trade before it reached its target price? Have you ever become frustrated and taken a trade that contradicts your research and planning? Have you ever become afraid of missing a trade and entered at the worst possible time? <coughs> FOMO, <coughs> buying at the top. Have you ever become reluctant to take a loss at your stop and then you end up with a significantly larger loss? These are what we call been there, done that moments. These are all learning moments that every trader has experienced through their, through their journey, um, through their trading journey and their growth. Now, the key to longevity is making these mistakes early in your development before you have too much on the line. So ideally you want to make the most of the most mistakes when you have the least amount uh, at risk or the, or the least amount to, to lose. Okay. Uh, so what causes these mistakes 
Well, if you ask traders, most of them will tell you the market, but that's not necessarily true. So people will say things like, well, the market got slow and range bound, so it you know caused boredom and then caused overtrading. Or a market reversal uh, generated some impulse trading and, and frustrated me. Okay, These are wrong. So just because a market event triggers an emotion doesn't mean the market is responsible for your feelings. And by the transitive property, it doesn't mean the market is responsible for your actions on those feelings. Okay, Because if the market had the power to compel emotional reactions, we would see every single person react the exact same way in every single situation. But this doesn't happen. Okay, So we know that there is more to the cause of emotions than external events. So in order for the market to generate a negative emotional response, we have to see it as a threat. Okay. So as an example, let's say the market becomes super slow and range bound. Okay. Now a good trader would see that as an opportunity to update some ideas, maybe prepare for the afternoon, would view it as an opportunity to get away from the screen, clear your head, um, start the afternoon fresh. A lot of traders go grab some lunch, go make a pot of coffee, what have you. Okay. This way, the slow action affects neither your feelings nor your trading behavior, and you can come back when there's more opportunity. Now, a bad thing to do would be if you tell yourself, you know, I got to make $1,000 a day, so this slow market is, is a threat to my trading goal, because when the market's slow, I can't make trades and I can't make money, and I have to make $1,000 a day. So when you view the market as lacking opportunity, um, that translates into a lack of profit in your mind and in your mindset. Okay. So you view a slow market as a threat to your career. So of course a slow market is going to trigger distress and overtrading. So it's that that uh, way of, of viewing your emotion that creates the threat for you. Okay? So your perception of the slow market is generating your mood. And because perception is the filter that we put between events and our response to events, okay, uh, if we adopt a distorted perceptions of the market in ourselves, will experience trading in distorted ways and we will experience distorted emotions and we will do stupid things that we shouldn't be doing in trades. So how do we change the filters that turn normal trading experiences into abnormal events? Well, first off, if you don't know your filters, you can't change them. Okay. So the first step is becoming aware of the expectations and beliefs that shape your expectations, um, that are that shape your perception. Uh, so that you can uh, process and work forward. Okay. Now here's a here's a good exercise to um, kind of figure those things out. So every time you experience a distinctly negative emotional reaction to a market event, ask yourself, how am I perceiving the market as a threat? Say it out loud. Say how like how why am I uncomfortable with this? Why am I seeing this as a bad thing? How am I perceiving this? This turns your attention to your perceptual process, giving you a chance to separate perceived threat from actual, real, objective threat. So here's an example. It's Friday and you want to end the week with a green trade. Okay, So you get into a trade to the long side and price moves in your direction and you're up. So as the price action moves up, you keep sliding up your stop loss. Okay. Now, when you then you hit a small reversal followed by a few candles of sideways chop. So you say, oh, I'm getting a little nervous about this sideways chop. I don't want this to drop on me. And you start to get this this urge to bail out of the trade. Okay. Now, before you do anything, you want to ask yourself, why am I nervous about this trade? Why am I perceiving the trade with such uneasiness? So you sit and reflect, and then after reflecting, you realize that there's nothing wrong with the trade. Your easiness is being driven by the fact that you want to end the week on a green trade. So there's nothing wrong with the trade, but you went into the trade saying, I need to end I need to end today with a green trade. So this trade has to be green. So that pressure turned a small reversal or a small otherwise ordinary uh, reversal on a winning trade into a threat. So after you realize the choppiness in the trade uh, might be a good place to add to your position rather than bail out of the position. So you add to it. And the trade runs up another few dollars and you sell well into the green and congratulations, you've made a good green trade for your Friday. So in that scenario, you turned a perceived threat 
into an opportunity. This is a key example of distinguishing a perceived threat versus an actual threat, because your perceived threat was that that sideways chop was bad because you needed to end the, the day on, on a green trade. And in all reality, when you zoomed out and you looked at it objectively, you realized that that was totally normal and you actually had the opportunity to add to your position so that you could make a little bit more money. So you recognize that your reflections on the market or, or you recognize your reflections on the market and your personal assumptions from that recognition. So when you think about your thinking by adopting the perspective of self-observer, you no longer buy into those negative thought patterns. So you're not too enclosed into your own mind. You're stepping outside of the situation and viewing yourself and objectively reasoning why you are reacting and thinking the way you are. So identify the perceived threat turn the perceived threat into an opportunity. This is a two-step process that addresses the true cause of emotional reactions that distort trading decisions. Keeping a psychological journal. Well, first we need to talk about how does journaling work? Okay, so when you're journaling technical chart patterns, you usually include annotated charts, okay? You mark your confirmations and disconfirmations of your patterns or your levels or whatever right? And uh, this highlights recognitions of the technical trading patterns in your charts. And then with frequent repetition, you can begin to see these patterns unfold in real time. This is what most people think of when they think of a technical trading journal. Now, keeping a psychological journal or including psychological elements in your trading journal, follow the same reasoning, okay? A journal is just a tool for recognizing your own patterns as a trader. Now, these patterns, um, these psychological patterns can include things like behavioral patterns, which are the tendencies to act in particular ways in given situations, emotional patterns, which are the tendencies to enter particular moods or states in reaction to particular events, and cognitive patterns, which are the tendencies to enter into specific thinking patterns or frames of mind in the face of personal or market-related situations. Almost all of our trading patterns are a combination of these three factors or these three elements okay so in response to your immediate environment you tend to think feel and act a certain way leading you to make rash decisions that interfere with your best market analysis and planning so that's why you journal your journal will recognize and change your patterns of distress so why do these patterns exist in the first place well maladaptive patterns generally begin as adaptations to challenging life situations. Now this is where um, you're gonna wanna get a little deep and be kind of reflective, okay? Because what ends up happening is as a child, you adopt a coping mechanism that works in the moment, but then hurts you in the long run as an adult. Or I mean, you can even develop some of these as an adult, but generally the examples are the patterns and behaviors that we develop in our youth then carry on with us into adulthood. So a good example of this is a child raised in an, in an environment of arguing and fighting might adapt to situations by blaming himself rather than, rather than risking a conflict by blaming others. So this translates into a trader who self-blames and suffers depressed moods. This can lead to all the trader's time and energy being spent beating himself up after a losing day rather than learning from his losses. So when you... Repeat patterns in trading that consistently lose you money or opportunity, the odds are good that you're replaying coping strategies from an earlier phase of life that's just reflecting in your trading. Well, the psychological journal is going to help you recognize and work towards unlearning those patterns. So the psychological journal is a tool for developing your internal observer. So you're learning to recognize what you're doing and when you're doing it. When you're journaling, the initial goal isn't to fix the, the pattern but just to be able to recognize it in the moment and see it in real time, uh, because that's going to be the first step. You can't fix it unless you can recognize it. So you need to learn how to recognize it in real time, which will take time because when you're being rolled by emotion, you need to learn how to step outside of it and recognize that you're being rolled by emotion. So here's a good uh, kind of journal format uh, or format for the psychological aspect of your trading journal. So you want to divide a piece of paper into three columns. The first is going to describe the specific situation in the markets. 
The second column is going to summarize your thoughts, feelings, and actions taken in response to that situation. And the third column is going to highlight the consequences of the particular cognitive, emotional, or action pattern. All right. Now your first two columns are going to help you recognize the situational trigger for your patterns. So the market was doing this, and so I thought and felt this. Okay. Now the third column is going to emphasize the negative consequences of your pattern. So the first two columns are the market was doing this, the second column is I reacted this way, and the third column is this is what happened because I reacted this way. Right? Now, negative consequences will range. There will be emotional distress, losing money on a trade, uh, failing to take action on an opportunity. Okay, so when we clearly link maladaptive patterns to negative consequences, we s develop and sustain the motivation to change these patterns because now we can see the link and we can see the process of of getting from getting from the market was slow to why I lost fifteen hundred dollars that day. Right? Uh, hopefully, no one's actually losing fifteen hundred dollar amounts when the market's slow, but you know, just from A to B. So the more detailed you are, the clearer the pattern. And the clearer you are about the pattern and its occurrences, and the more strongly you feel about the costs it imposes on you, the more likely you'll be to catch the pattern in real time and be motivated to interpret and change it next time, right? So when you're linking those consequences to that process, that kind of creates that emotional, um, uh, what's it called, that emotional motivation to recognize that pattern and to, um, well, at the very first, you're going to want to just recognize it, but then eventually to fix it in the moment or to, to work through it in the moment. And when it comes to your trading journal, the longer period of time you journal, the more variations you'll see of your most common patterns. And that way you can start to distinguish all the different types of ways that you experience those feelings and those emotional changes um, through various situations. So just remember that you can't change something if you're not aware of it. And that is really the purpose of your psychological journal is to help you become aware of the problem so that you can recognize them in real time uh, so that you can eventually change them. Pressing. When you try too hard to make money. Now pressing is known uh, more commonly as forcing a trade, which is trying to make something happen. Now, before um, you get too down on yourself, I'm just going to say, if you haven't made this mistake, do you even trade, bro? Because literally every trader has made this mistake. It's part of the process. It's part of the journey. We've all forced trades. Okay. Now, there's two mindsets for trading. The first is, is the selective trader that lets the market come to them and they wait for their opportunity to jump in. And then there's the mindset of pressing, which is when the trader tries to make things happen and attempts to force trades, right? Now, the subtle art of trading requires controlled aggression, okay? It's, it's about knowing when you can put your full weight on something and, and when you can't, okay? And the best way of instilling this control is to trade with our rules. And those rules govern our position sizing, our stop losses, uh, knowing when to enter, knowing when to stay out. This is a big one. I think this is a, this is a big um, catalyst for pressing is knowing when to stay out because a lot of times uh, us traders, let's say, uh, let's say you have eight criteria for entering a trade. And if it's a slow day and a trade meets six of your eight criteria, you're going to want to jump in because it's almost there. But the difference between um, you know, a disciplined trader and a non-disciplined trader is that a non-disciplined trader says, oh, six out of eight criteria is good enough. A disciplined trader says, no, I'm only taking those A plus setups and six out of eight is still a loser. I want to make sure I have all eight criteria are met before I jump into a trade. So knowing when to stay out is really important. And then lastly, trading with trends. So we know that when rules are repeated and followed over time, they're internalized and they become mechanisms of self-control. So the right trading behaviors will begin as rules, and then the more you repeat them and ingrain them, they end up as habits. When we press to make money, 
the need to put on trades overwhelms our rule governance. So pressing normally occurs in situations where we're frustrated with our performance, hence revenge trading, right? You take a trade or two and you're down on the day and you're upset and you're frustrated and you have moved from psychological stress into psychological distress and now you're out for blood and now you start forcing things and you turn a small red day into a large red day, right? So have you lost money, missed out on an opportunity, to get into a good trade because you were too busy looking at it, hoping it would go in the opposite direction? Have you ever gone through a period of flat equity curve where nothing's happening, you're just breaking even, or maybe you have days where you can't, you know, there's not even any trades that set up for that day, right? Uh, that's totally normal. Frustration leads us to try and create opportunities rather than to respond to those present in the market, okay? So very important, when you dance with the market, you want the market to lead. This way, you're identifying what's happening in front of you and you have all the information in front of you rather than trying to anticipate what is going to happen. When you try to guess the future, there's a 50-50 chance that you're wrong and you don't have all the information in front of you. When you're identifying what's happening right in front of you, you have all the information there. So if your analysis is correct and you have proper rules um, and proper criteria for entering trades, you have all the information there. So your chances of success go way, way up because you can see what's actually in front of you. Trying to lead the market has the potential to turn normal losses and flat periods into slumps. And that's, again, why things like revenge trading are so dangerous. So one loss or two losses in a day is normal. That's a normal loss. And you, that's why we have rules to govern what we do in those situations. Now getting frustrated and then jumping back in, that's when you create huge red days and that's when a normally flat period or a break even period becomes a slump. Repeating your trading rules over and over internalizes them and they become habits which ground you in your decision making, leaving you less likely to fall prey to distress. And when you coach yourself, you can create opportunities for repetition before and during the trading day. Okay. Now this looks like, um, this is this is the process for kind of what that looks like. So you want to make a list of your most important trading rules, and that includes rules for risk management, for taking breaks after large and multiple losses, for entering at defined uh, signal points, for your rules about preparing for the market day. So a big thing about this is you can't expect to internalize trading rules if you haven't made them explicit. If you can't say, my rules are X, Y, Z, okay? Um, so that way you have something hard to act on. So what you want to do is create a routine before trading begins to review those rules, okay? And that uh, we know that mental rehearsals are powerful vehicles for creating repetition. So what you want to do is you want to visualize yourself in different trading situations, um, and that reminds you of the rules and then how those rules will apply in those situations and how you will plan to follow those rules in those situations. The more extended and detailed the visualizations, the more likely it is that you'll internalize them as realistic expectations. Okay. Now, another part of this process or continuing through this process is create a break in your trading day to review your rule following. So mostly, you know, the most obvious is, is lunchtime, right, at noon. So the midday slowdown is a perfect time for a quick, clear-headed reflection. So you want to turn your list of rules into a checklist, and then at lunch, just check yes or no if you followed those rules throughout your morning trades. And if you didn't follow a rule, you jot that rule down on a piece of paper, and you tape it to your monitor, and then you make that rule an explicit focus for the afternoon trading session. So you know that that's, that's what you're struggling with today, so you want to make sure that that's the rule that you keep in mind with you as you go into the afternoon. So then you use the rules at the end of the day as a measuring tool, as a report card for how you did. Okay. An end of the day review will help tell you how well you performed in preparation and execution of trades. And what you want to do is you want to give each rule a letter grade, right? So how did I, how well did I follow this rule? Anything less than a grade of B then becomes an explicit goal for the next day's trading. So, uh, you know, today I was kind of played fast and loose with my position sizing. And I think that that was the reason why I had such a large loss, because if I hadn't tripled down on my position for no reason, uh, then I wouldn't have had 
you know, as big of a loss as I did. Well, that gave myself a grade of a C minus on position sizing. So that's something I'm working on tomorrow. Okay. The more you think about these rules and rehearse them, the more they become a part of you and a part of how you see the market and a part of how you trade in the market. When you're ready to hang it up. One of the most difficult manifestations of distress for traders is despair. Okay, So tell me, has this happened to you? You work really hard and you're on the brink of a really positive breakthrough in your trading. Then something happens and you stumble and fall back a few steps in your progress. Right, So then you feel like you're getting nowhere because you feel like all that work was for nothing. You're tired of being wrong. You're tired of losing money. And more importantly, the excitement that you used to feel at the start of the market day is replaced with dread. That's a big key, right? When you're no longer excited to do what you love. It's difficult to sustain the research and the morning routine for preparations. So you start thinking, what's the use? Okay. Then you start putting yourself in a mindset. You're ready to quit. You're, you're ready to, to give it up. Now we're going to get real for a second. Okay. So for some traders, there is a time to give up trading. Okay. Not all traders, but if you've been at it for years and you've, you still don't have the skills or the basic competence to at least cover your costs. If you've been consistently losing money for years, okay. If you're expelling all this effort and not seeing any kind of learning curve, this may not be your calling at that point. Maybe it is time for you to hang it up and just pursue something that's going to genuinely capture your distinct abilities. Okay. Now to be com to be absolutely clear, this is not quitting. Okay. This is not being a coward. This is just cutting a losing position and just getting into something better. And that's a, that's a strategy that we use in trading, but it's just as applicable in life as it is in trading. If something's not working for you in life, get out of it, switch to something that will work for you. Okay. If you're meant to do something, something that speaks to your talent, skills, and interests, you'll display a significant learning curve in the first year or two of real effort. And the reason why I underline real is because a lot of us retail traders, we trade on the side and we kind of, um, how do I put this? We, we try to, we try to do things with shortcuts. Okay. So if you're not willing to do the study, so real effort means willing to do the study, willing to, in, in our case here at Bullish Bears, willing to watch the videos, willing to engage in the discussions, willing to truly learn. That's, that's real effort. So if you've just been trading on the side and you watch a YouTube video here and you watch a YouTube video there, that's not real effort. But if you decide that you actually are ready to learn and, and envelop yourself in everything, in the economics of the market, in the facets of trading and patterns and everything that goes along with that, learning about trading psychology, that's true effort. Now, if you are really giving forth true effort and you'll, you'll see a significant learning curve if it's something that you're meant to do. We all experience difficult periods and discouragement and, and discouragement and depression are the emotional challenge of those such periods. Okay. So being your own trading coach, you need to be able to shepherd yourself through those situations. You need to be able to pull yourself out of the muck when you're feeling that despair, discouragement and depression are emotions. Now, remember emotions contain information. Okay. So what discouragement tells us is that in that moment, we perceive an unbridgeable gap between who we are and who we want to be. And discouragement means that we no longer feel that we have control over our future. We no longer see that efficacy of being able to bridge that gap to reach that goal. Okay. Now as an effective trading coach, we need to accept this perception and we need to see that our real selves are always distant from our ideal selves. So the question is whether we perceive ourselves to be competent to bridge that gap. So what you want to do as your trading coach is you want to see the reality of that gap, but then you want to start inserting, um, logic and goals and things that can start to give us a foothold so that we can begin to, uh, start to bridge that gap. So in the context of the real idea gap, there may be something in your discouragement that's based in reality. Okay. 
maybe a trading edge that you've counted on all this time is no longer there. It no longer works. Maybe market patterns have changed. Maybe something that was working for you before is no longer working. Okay. So maybe temporarily you should just hang it up and you should figure out what's wor what's working with your trading and what isn't before you continue to try to force it and continue to, to lose money. So you want to do a review and an analysis and you know maybe you come to realize that your expectations are too unrealistic. Okay? If you're expecting to make money every single day, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. And then when you hit a losing streak, that's totally reasonable by chance, right? Because remember, we can't control the market. So we can, we can have periods of times where we are following all of our trading rules and we're doing everything right. And the market is still handing us multiple red days in a week or multiple red days in a month. So you want to make sure that if you're expecting to make money every day, you're, you're setting yourself up to let those red days really cut deep. And so you want to pull yourself out of that mindset so you're able to bounce back. Okay. When we uh, expect the best, we leave ourselves poorly prepared for the worst. Now, this, uh, a big proponent of this is burnout. Okay. And so burnout is when you feel overwhelmed by the demands that you face. Okay. When the demand on you exceeds your resources for dealing <clears throat> with that demand. So for, tr for traders, burnout usually means a lack of life balance. Just because markets or, or being a trader, is it's very easy for it to just consume your whole life and take your rest and you want to be plugged in 24 seven, especially now that you can get all this information on your phone, you know, burnout usually means a, a lack of, of life balance. Okay. So you become so immersed in the stresses of trading that recreational, social, creative, and spiritual outlets are lost. Immersions like this are necessary for short periods of time, but they leave traders impaired in the long run. So sometimes if you're trying to learn something new or learn the new facet of the market, sometimes you're going to have those days where you are, you know, pulling super long days, 12 hours or something, or you are reading about stuff and you're learning something new. That's good in short spurts when you're trying to uh, attain a short goal, but you can't, you can't keep that longevity going forever as a trader because it'll exhaust you. So it's different to sustain energy. It's, diff it's difficult to sustain energy and enthusiasm when you're exhausted and overloaded. Okay. So what you want to do is treat the lost drive as information, pull the information out of what you're feeling. Okay. Maybe it's reflection of changes in the market. Maybe it's a signal of unrealistic self demands. Maybe it's a signal that your life is out of balance. Okay. If the feeling of giving up is a function of your trading after you begin to analyze, if it's a function of your trading, you want to reduce your risk, reassess your trading and preserve your capital and turn your discouragement into opportunity. So you feel this, you feel this despair. And then if you realize that this despair is being, is being caused by your trading, these are steps that you can do to start begin to get some of that control back to start to begin to bridge that gap. If the feeling of giving up is a function of your own self demands, you want to redouble your efforts on goal settings, attainable goal settings. Okay. Make sure that each day and week start with realistic, achievable goals. So that way you can start to rebuild that self-confidence and, um, start to rebuild that efficacy. And by remember by setting those achievable goals, any effort that you put out is reflected back on you in a positive way. Okay. If burnout is contributing to a lack of optimism, consciously structure your life outside of trading, do some exercise, go be social, spend time away from the market. So that way you kind of bring a little bit of balance, you know, back into your life and that should help a little bit. Have significant life goals apart from trading. If all of your psychological eggs are in the basket of trading, it's going to be really difficult to keep energetic and enthusiastic if you hit uh, a period where, you know, everything's sideways or, you know, the market's not as volatile as you need it to be. So you want to make sure that you're not smashing down or that you're not piling up all this stress and all these expectations on the top of your head so that when you hit a completely normal patch of, you know, flatness, everything doesn't come crashing down on top of you. What to do when fear takes over? 
All right, we're going to do a little bit of, re of a recap here. Okay, fear is normal in the face of danger. Okay, and basically we know that when we see fear, we are naturally primed for that fight or flight response, which hones our senses and gets us to concentrate and allows us to focus all of our energy on the problem at hand. Sometimes danger uh, responses are not objective threats, they're interpretations that are perceived as threats, right? And when you feel nervous in a trade or feel nervous about putting on a trade, it's important to know whether your response is one of fear or just one of anxiety, whether that feeling is an actual threat or whether it's just you being a little nervous about it. So don't identify fear as negative and try to push past it. You want to extract the information that lies in that emotion. All right, so there's a little recap of, of fear. So moving forward, what do you do when, nervous, when nervousness enters your decision making? So the nervous feeling, think of it like a warning light on the car, right? It says, hey, uh, I'm not comfortable with the trade right now. Something's going on. Okay, so you say, well, why am I not comfortable? Uh, has something important changed in the trade that I'm in? And here's an example of, of fear in a trade. Okay. So let's say you decide to bump up your position sizing. You take your first trade with your new size and a few minutes into it, you start to get a little anxious. You start to kind of experience this fear a little bit. So you say, why am I nervous? Why am I feeling this way? So you go back through and you review your rules, your entry criteria and everything. And uh, everything in the trade so far meets your criteria and there's nothing when you go down the checklist, right? You go down that checklist and all the boxes are checked. So there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the trade. So this leads you to acknowledge that you're just feeling some anxiety because you've increased your risk on the trade and you have to get used to how this new uh, risk uh, profile feels in the trade. Okay. So you review and then reassure your stop levels and your overall trading plan. And that gives you more confidence to weather this anxiety to start to get used to how this anxiety feels because this is in fact just a normal measured risk. This is nothing outside of what you already had predefined. So carrying that, carrying out that internal dialogue keeps you from reacting emotionally to the perception of fear. Now here's an example of fear when you're trying to enter a trade. Okay. So if you see a trade that you, that you think you should be taking, but you're not sure. So you say, why am I uncomfortable with this idea? Do I really have an edge here on this trade? So you, you say, you know, I'm not really sure if this is going to be a good trade. Does my edge exist? So again, you review your rationale. You go through your rules. Is it going with the market trend? Can it be executed with a favorable risk to reward balance? Is it a pattern that I've, that I have traded successfully in the past? And is it occurring in a market environment with sufficient volume and volatility? So you check all the boxes and you say, yeah, this meets, um, this meets all the requirements for my trading. So that emotion or that anxiety that I'm feeling has nothing to do uh, with the trade that discomfort you know, might be just my anxiety about the trade. So sometimes it helps to speak out loud so you can hear yourself work through this process. And I mean, you, you can use tools, right? So you make yourself a checklist comprised of all these factors that gets you into a trade or that keeps you in a trade. And you can review these principles out loud to yourself. I mean, I have a whiteboard above my, above my monitor and that's where I have all my trading rules. And it's literally in my line of sight at all times. So I can see you know, I can remind myself why I'm in the trade or why I took that trade. So this differentiates, this helps you differentiate between discomfort with an idea because it's something new and unknown and discomfort with an idea because it's bad. Okay. Because the fear of the unknown is a byproduct of change. So you're going to have that discomfort every time you try to change something, every time you try to grow a little bit, uh, every time you try to add something unknown or having anxiety of unknown isn't bad as long as it fits your rules and your predefined risk. Okay. So if you can use fear this way and extract the information and analyze it rather than letting it control you and just creating these knee jerk reactions, um, negative emotions actually become a set of trading tools to help you, uh, in the moment. Performance anxiety, the most common trading problem. Now, performance anxiety occurs anytime our thinking about a performance interferes with the act of performing. Okay. 
So as an example, let's say you're going to give a presentation to a group of people as part of a job interview process. As you start talking, you notice that the audience is not very attentive. People are on their phones, people are, you know, looking at what's papers that they've got on the table, what have you. So the thought enters your mind that you aren't being sufficiently engaging. So you start to think that you're losing their interest, and therefore you may lose the job because you're going to mess the interview up. So you try to improvise something funny or something to grab their attention, but your nervousness just gets in the way and just trips you up. You lose your train of thought, and then you awkwardly kind of stumble back to your pre-prepared script. Your performance anxiety just took over your presentation, or just took over your, your thought process, and your presentation suffered as a result. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Now, trading performance anxiety usually occurs when we're doing things like taking on more risk and trying to trade larger positions, uh, we're entering a slump and becoming consumed with our losses and that blocks us from making good trades, uh, or when we're feeling so much pressure to make a profit that we start cutting our winning trades short. Now this next part, I added this, I don't know if this is a real, real word, but I, I just really like it. Don't engage in catastrophizing. I don't think, I don't know if that's the proper use of that word, but I, I thought it was, it was good. Losses aren't a threat to your self-perception or livelihood. You might want to write these on a, on a piece of paper and put them, you know, above your computer monitor. Losses are not a threat to your self-perception or livelihood. Okay. Don't let yourself become consumed with your losses. You want to trade to profit not trade to or not trade to avoid losing money an expert so think of it like this an expert does not think positively or negatively about a performance as it's occurring rather he is wholly absorbed in the act of performing so in a trade you should not care whether you are making or losing money you should care about keeping control of your trading rules and making sure that all your criteria for the trade and your criteria for staying in the trade are met and if you if you make money you make money if you lose money you lose money but you should not be thinking about anything outside of what's happening in that moment so how do you overcome performance anxiety as a trader well you want to carefully track your worst trading days and then make conscious efforts to turn those into learning experiences so let's say, as an example, you have a reliable setup that tells you when a stock is going to move higher. So you have this part of your strategy that you know when a stock is about to pop long. Okay? You buy into the stock and then it promptly moves up in the direction that you wanted it to. Then all of a sudden it reverses and drops below your entry point. So now you're, now you're down. And you note that the reversal occurred on significant volume. Uh, so you say, okay, and that's outside of, of your normal uh, of your normal setup. So you say, okay, I'm just going to take this loss. Now, you could lament your bad luck for having been hit with that wave of uh, volume, curse the market for making you lose, quote unquote, making you lose, or pressure yourself to make it all up in the next trade. But these negative actions uh, will contribute to performance pressure in your next trade. They're not going to uh, constructively aid your trading. They're going to uh, create performance anxiety the next time you jump back into the market. So what are the alternatives? Make sure you're using uh, the loss of trading. Uh, make sure you're using every loss as a review. Okay. So you start thinking, are other stocks in the sector selling off? Is the broader market dropping? Has news come out affecting my stock uh, sector or the overall market? Uh, did I execute my setup properly? Did I execute the setup too late? Did I execute the setup too early? So you go into full uh, you know, analyzing mode and you take a look at everything. Your goal as your own trading coach is to get to the point where you value good trading ideas that don't work because you're eliminating a possibility that could hurt you in the future. Okay? If a market is not behaving the way it normally does in a given situation, it's sending you a loud message. And if you're executing your ideas the way you usually do, you're getting a clear indication uh, to target an area that needs improving, right? So you say, this is part of my strategy, this is what I always do, and I'm getting rolled by this element of the market. Well, then we need to take a look at that. We need to see 
we need to figure out how to improve this trading rule so that this element of the market uh, doesn't continue to roll me, right? By acting on the idea that losses present opportunity, you take a good part of the threat out of losing. This keeps you in a positive mindset to learn and sustain your development without inhibiting performance anxiety. And what this does is it basically cuts performance anxiety at the knees because performance anxiety doesn't mean anything when you know it's okay to mess up and when you have a game plan for messing up. And more importantly, when you have a game plan of picking yourself up and then continuing forward after you've fallen. Square pegs and round holes. Finding what fits you as a trader. What you trade and how you trade should be an expression of your distinctive cognitive style and strength. So it should fit who you are as a person. A central concept of enhancing trader performance is that you can maximize your development and profitability by discovering a niche and operating primarily within it. So find figuring out what it is you do well in the market and then just doing that thing. So a trading niche has several components. The first is a specific market or an asset class. Some markets are more volatile than others. Some are more mature and offer more market depth. Some offer more information, okay? So the personality of the market must fit the personality of the trader. So as an example, if you thrive on data co collection and analysis of historical patterns of volume and sentiment, Maybe you trade in the stock market because that's full of information and it's full of moment by moment sentiment. So you can feel that. Maybe you stay away from the currency market because volume and moment to moment sentiment and currencies are a little more opaque and there's not as much information there in the moment for you to feed off of. Number two, a core strategy. This captures your ways of making sense of supply and demand, right? So are you trend trading? Are you counter trend trading? Do you like directional trades? Do you like relational trades that express relative value, something like a spread? Some traders are highly visual and prefer charts. Some traders are more statistically oriented and model driven. So you gotta figure out which, which kind of fits you better. Number three, a time frame. Different trades have different time frames. Scalping is very quick. Intraday trades can be quick to moderate. Swing trades can be moderate to long. Time frames determine what you're looking at in the market. So market makers will uh, pay great attention to order flow because that's what matters to them, as opposed to portfolio managers that they'll focus, they may, may not care so much about the order flow, but they focus more on the macroeconomic fundamentals of the market. Your time frame determines the speed of decision making and the relative balance between time spent managing trades versus your time spent researching them. So are you going to do all your work before you get into the trade or are you going to do a little bit of work before the trade and then when you get in the trade you're going to you're going to keep your hand on the steering wheel and you're going to make sure you're steering that car, right? So time frame affects risk. It determines the trader's interactions with the market. So that's why time frame is very important. Next, a framework for decision making. So are you discretionary and intuitive in your decision making? Uh, or do you process, do you process market information as it unfolds in front of you? Or do you rely more on considerable prior analysis before making decisions like we just talked about? Do you like to do your work before you get into the trade? Or do you like to do all your work when you're in the trade? Are you completely structured and mechanical in your trading? Or do you trade with your gut and abide by less rigid guidelines? So every trader makes this blend of analytical and intuitive differently. And what we've seen is that most of the distress that traders experience occur when they're operating outside of their niche, when they're operating outside of this blend that they prefer. So a trader's niche is defined as their sweet spot. You will always trade better when you wait for pitches that are right in your swing spot or right in your sweet spot, right? When you only swing at the pitches that are perfect for you. Our emotional experience reflects the degree to which we're consistently operating within our niche. When needs, interests, values, and environment fit well with our, with our uh, trade plan, we have a positive emotional experience. And when those things don't fit well into our trade plan, we have a negative experience or we experience 
to stress. So you, you want to keep yourself within your niche and only swing at pitches that fall into your swing, into your sweet spot. I keep wanting to say swing spot, fall into your sweet spot. So what is your wheelhouse? What do you do best in the markets? If you could trade just one strategy, use one instrument on one time frame, what would it be? Do you know the answer to these questions? Have you taken inventory of your past trades to see which work and which have been outside of your sweet spot? If not, here's a way to figure it out. Label all your trades with a letter grade, A, B, or C. Your A trades are the trades that are clearly within your sweet spot. Those are your bread and butter, your best trades. Those are, those are your A plus setups that you see them, you execute them correctly. They're not super taxing. You know what you're doing and, and you, hit those, uh, you hit those out of the park. Your B trades are your good trades. They're not gimme trades um, or they're not home runs, but they're consistent winners. You may have to uh, spend a little bit more time working them. They may not come as easy as your A trades, but they're still good trades. Your C trades are your marginal or speculative trades. The ones that are clear out, clearly outside your warehouse or your wheelhouse. The ones where you say, I can't believe, <laughs> I can't believe I made money on that trade. <laughs> that was, that was all, that was a lucky trade. Okay. So over time you can track the profitability of your trades. And then the, the most profitable trades are all the trades that are linked with your letter A. You can find the commonality in those trades and that will be your niche. And then the more clearly you identify your niche, the less likely you are to get away from it. And this benefits your overall profitability and your emotional experience over time because you understand what you're good at and you understand how to execute that. Volatility of markets and volatility of mood. So you want to make sure that you know your market and make sure you adjust your trade strategy according to that market. So markets markets will change throughout the year. So the market volatility we see in say January could be different in May, August, or October. The market has its slumps, you know, just like anything else. So market changes in volatility can create emotional volatility. And this is what we, this is what we want to be careful with. We become reactive to markets because we don't adjust what those, we don't adjust to what those markets are doing. So when something happens, uh, we realize that, uh, or we feel victimized by the market because, oh, the market did this to me. Well, you can't control what the market's doing. So all you can do is adjust yourself, adjust the factors that you can control so that you are operating correctly within a market that is changing. When markets move from high to low volatility, we see that they tend to frustrate aggressive traders. And then again, when markets move from low to high volatility, they become threatening to risk averse traders. The volatility of markets contributes to volatility of mood because the potential risk and rewards of any given trade change meaningfully in the change of the market. Remember that risk and reward are proportional. Pursuing large gains inevitably brings large drawdowns. So the key to success is trading within your risk tolerance so that swings don't change how you view markets and make decisions. Don't be, don't be shooting for huge gains if you can't take equally huge losses. So you want to make sure that your, that your risk profile on both sides, I think most people, most people think, uh, only in terms of, of what you can gain. And you don't think in terms of what you can lose. You say, I normally trade with a, you know, share size of 50 shares, but today I'm going to share with 150 shares because I can triple my gain. Well, guess what? With 150 shares, you can also triple your loss. So you need to make sure that you're viewing both of those sides, especially if the market is, is operating outside of you know, something that's normal okay? or what you consider to be normal. So do you know the, the volatility of the markets you're currently trading right now? Have you adjusted your trading to take smaller profits and losses in low volatility markets and then also uh, increase your profits and losses when volatility expands? If you're trading different markets or different instruments, do you adjust your expectations for the volatility of these? You wouldn't drive the same in bumper to bumper traffic as you would on a wide open freeway. So similarly, you don't want to be trading crazy size and all this crazy stuff in a, uh, in a super slow market. So you don't want to, you don't want to be treating all markets the same. So how do we calculate volatility? Well, a good way to do it by hand, okay, is you take the last 20 days of trading and you calculate the median high to low price range in various time frames. 
And then this gives you an expectation of price swings within the context of the day and then within the context of the time of the day. This is really helpful because, for example, if you see that the average move on the market is 12 points in a morning session and that market has already moved 10 points, you know that it's probably not the best idea to jump into it when it's already moved 10 points because on average it only moves 12. So the chances that you're going to get it to push past 12 are very low. So when volatility is small, focus on good executions, clear stops, and tight price targets. So you guys are seeing this repetition, right? When when things are crazy, you guys need to dig your heels into your trading rules. Dig your heels into the things that you can control. Dig your heels into the precision of executing your trading strategy. That is the fallback always whenever something is happening that you don't understand, whenever there's a change, whenever you are faced with any kind of adversity. That's what you want to be doing. Focusing on good executions, clear stops, and tight price targets. As volatility expands, you can widen your stops. You can you can get a little a little give it a little bit of breathing room, right? You can raise your profit targets, adjust your sizing, uh, but that's because the market will allow that. Instead of letting market movement control you, adjust your trading to the day's environment, and that way you are uh, either letting the reins out or pulling the reins in on the factors that you can control within a market that you can't control, and that's volatility. All right, so just kind of a little uh, recap. We're now towards, we're now at the end of the video. So just kind of an overall recap of this section of stress and distress. So stress exists all around us and it isn't necessarily a bad thing. You will always fail if you continuously try to eliminate stress or try to operate outside of stress. The goal is to keep stress from becoming distress because, again, stress is just a matter-of-fact response. Distress is an emotional state of mind. This means distinguishing between stresses that are part of our trading profession and the stresses we unwillingly place on ourselves. Well, thank you guys uh, for watching this part two. Uh, if you want to read more, again, here's the book, the, Dra the Daily Trading Coach by Brett N. Steenbarger, 101 Lessons for Becoming Your Own Trading Psychologist. Um, and uh, we got part three uh, will be coming out here shortly. So keep an eye out for that. And we will see you guys in part three.